This is my tool chest. I made this back in the 1940s, in the last year of my apprenticeship. Now, all cabinet makers done that. I was no exception. You were allowed to go back after hours, you weren't allowed to do it in governor's time, and make your tool chest. And you were judged, all your life as a cabinet maker, you were judged on the quality of your chest, so you were gonna put your best bet in now. Now, it's a marvellous thing is the tool chest. It's evolved until it fulfills its purpose absolutely perfectly. The tools on the bench go in the chest at night. You always clean your bench off last thing at night and they sit on the plane boards down here. And of course, during the day, they're up on the planing strip on the bench. Underneath the plane boards are our bench planes that aren't in regular use. Our bench chisels are all close to hand, the long pairing gouges and chisels, and then down under here we've got all our long tools, our panel gauges and squaring rods, long rules and so on, and then the next one up we've got our saw till with all our bench saws and so on in, and then over the back, right at the bottom, this would be full, of course, of moulding planes. Most of my tools don't live in the chest anymore, they're scattered around the workshop. But the main reason for showing you this is not to show off. What I want you to see is all these dovetails. The whole of the chest is literally a mass of dovetails. The till, every till is, all, is held together by these, the drawers all got lap dovetails at the ends, nice oak sides lap dovetailed into mahogany fronts and the tills look they slide on oak this all really is to accommodate the wear and not only on the inside by tradition there was no swank on the outside of the case whatsoever it was just painted flat paint even the handles were rope grummets. But we've got dovetails in the plinth. Even if it's mitered at the top, we've got it dovetailed for strength. The whole of the carcass is dovetailed, lap dovetailed here. And even the cornice is lap dovetailed. The whole idea of the dovetails was strength. We needed strength. Don't forget this weighed a lot when it was full of tools. And it had to be moved from job to job. Uh, it lived at the end of the cabinet maker's bench, but of course, he changed employer. Now, all those dovetails, and dovetails, they're reputedly difficult to cut, but they're not. Quite honestly, it's harder to make a good mortise and tenon than it is a dovetail. I'll show you. Well, here we are. I said we'd talk about dovetails. And here we've got a straightforward lap dovetail joint. Nice big one, so we can see all the features. Here you can see the actual tail. And of course, it's obvious why it's called a dovetail. It's the shape of a dove's tail. Let's take that apart and we can really look at the various features. There we are. Now we can really see the dovetail. Now, what are we going to call these angles, slopes, or pitch? We'll call them the slope. Now, that slope is a certain optimum angle to it. In other words, if it was too great, the grain would be very short. What I'm saying is, if we cut this side at that sort of angle, this grain would be very, very short, and it would break out, the joint wouldn't be very strong. If we made it too shallow, the joint would pull apart. So there's an optimum angle to that. So we make that slope 
normally I make mine one in seven. But there's some people say that in softwood it should be one in six. And in hardwood, one in eight. Well, I don't think that matters very much, as long as it's sort of in that ballpark. So that is the, the actual parts of the tail. Now let's look at it in a little more detail. Here I've got a through dovetail, just two bits of wood dovetailed together. Here we've got some names to remember again. We've got the tails, which are dovetail shape, and the bits between them are called the pins. And the end ones are obviously called the end pins. But if you look carefully at this, you'll see that we've got end grain on the tails and we've got end grain on the pins. So both faces have got end grain showing. This is fine for boxes and maybe the back of drawers and things, but a lot of people don't want to see this end grain. In fact, on a lot of quality work, end grain is considered obscene. We don't want it. Probably the pinnacle of dovetail joints looks like that. It's a straight, uh, straight mitre in appearance, but in actual fact, there we go. It's a dovetail. The secret dovetailed mitre joint. We've got tails and we've got pins. And the whole caboodle goes together and we eyed up all that hard work. If you say dovetails to most people, what do they think about? Drawers. So here's a drawer. This comes out of my tool chest that we were looking at earlier on. And we can see the features here. We've got a nice oak side tailed into the mahogany front. We can see the tails and we can see the pins. But when we look at the drawer front, there's no end grain. We call that a lap dovetail, and that's probably the most useful dovetail to be able to make. If you can make that, you can certainly cut the through dovetail that we've got on the back of the drawer. So what we'll do, we'll look at drawer making. Well, okay, so when we're making a box or a drawer, it's rather important that we don't get the parts muddled up. We've got four bits that are very, very similar. So if we stand these up here like that, we can see what. Okay, so all the face marks are in the right direction, but how the hell do we know that that doesn't go there and that go there? And what's more, if we mark that out to go there and then we assembled it over here, we would be in the stuck. So we need some way of keeping the parts in orientation. And in the cabinet trade, we've got a little conventional way of doing that. We unroll the drawer and we mark it like this. We put a little half circle on here and a half circle on there. Look at that. Okay. And we call this one, two, two, three, three, four, four. And that's one again because it goes back to there like so. And now, whenever we pick this up and we've got to mark something to it, we can just put it on our half circle, comes back with the same numbers and exactly the same from the other end. No problems. So we can get rid of them scruffy little bits and we'll have some nice wood. How about this? Well, there's the, the drawer from my toolbox and we're going to talk about this corner here. So this piece will be the drawer front, this nice piece of mahogany. And here we've got a nice piece of oak. We usually make good quality furniture as oak drawer linings because all the weight of the drawer keeps rubbing on here and oak wears extremely well. So that's, that's where we're going. We now need to set this out. If this was a drawer, it's about the only thing I can think of that you fit before you make it. These sides will have been fitted into the carcass and the drawer front would have been fitted in a perfect fit into the carcass. Well, we've only got part of a drawer, so we want to make sure that our ends here are absolutely square. 
So what we'll do, we'll just shoot these up nice and tidy. Now I'm going to use my nice old mitre plane, but not everybody is lucky enough to have one of those. But if you've got a block plane, just an ordinary nine and a half, that, 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 that'll work on end grain perfectly well. But why should I use that when I've got something like this? So there we are. There we are, shot nice and square, look. And exactly the same with this. There we go. That was painless, wasn't it? Now, just so that we don't get in a muddle, and I don't confuse you, what we'll do, we'll pretend it was a complete drawer, and that was joint number two. There we go. That'll keep us in line. We come again to, to another strange tool. This is one I had made for me. I find working with a big cutting gauge like this rather clumsy and not as accurate as I'd like to be. So this is Jim's own and you'll see why in a minute. We need to set this up first and foremost to the thickness of the drawer side. Here we've got the lining Let's have it exactly right. Now you see why we've got an adjuster here that is a micro adjuster, just like on an engineer's vernier caliper. There we go. That's exactly the drawer th side thickness. And the drawer side is going to go into there. So we need to mark that thickness. If we mark that thickness on there, That is the amount of wood that's needed to be removed for that to go in nicely. The next thing we've got to decide is how far we put those dovetails into the draw side. In other words, how thick is this lap going to be? Now we're going to break a rule here. You always gauge, at least that's what you're told, from the face or the face edge. This time we're going to gauge from the back. In other words, we're going to gauge from this face across here the length of the dovetail. Um, on this sort of work, there is no rule. Um, it, it rather depends on the type of wood and the thickness of the draw front and various things like that. From experience, I'd say that that's a good length for the tail. And up here, we're going to just put a line. And that line is the length that that's going in there. Now if we very gently, we don't want a very deep line because you're weakening the tails across there. That is also the length of the dovetails. Now what we need to do on this piece of wood, we need to mark some tails out. Now we've got two tools that we can use. There are various patterns of dovetail template. The, this pattern is always made by the craftsman himself, quite often out of wood. But um, I made mine out of perspex so that I can see through it. It makes it much easier to position. And you can see that this is the, the actual slope. This one, in effect, is about one in, one in eight. Or you can buy a proprietary one made, made by Richard Cow, quite a nice little tool, which goes on the end. As you can see, this is a one in eight slope. You can set the width of the dovetail by these little screws and you can actually move the template from one side to the other. This part is detachable and you can replace it with one that marks one in six for softwood. But I prefer my homemade one. So we take a pencil and let's first and foremost mark our two end pins. In other words, that's one and that's the other one. Now, you might not believe this, but when you've been cutting dovetails for a few years, your dovetail saw falls automatically on that angle and you don't need to do this. You can put it in the vise and do it without any setting out at all. But um, I'm not going to prove that to you.
we sharpen the chisel edge on a pencil. Here we go. The pencil for setting out is all sharpened like a chisel. And we keep it in trim by rubbing it on a piece of garnet paper. And keep that out of the way because we don't have black lead on the job. Now then, we've got to divide this up into the number of, of tails we're going to put on there. And if we look at this, we've got something like, what have we got? We've got an inch, an inch and nine sixteenths, sorry, three inches and nine sixteenths to divide into four. Now that hurts the head, doesn't it? And woodworkers are never any good at maths. So we have a little dodge. What we do, we take the centre of that end pin and bring a line down parallel there. And then we put the rule across from the centre of that end pin until we've got a measurement that we can divide easy. Well, there you go, four. So let's put a tick at each inch. There we go, look. And we can take them up to the end. And that's the centre of our pins. Take our gauge again, our dovetail template, and we can mark. We can mark our pins out. Now, here we come to another arbitrary thing. How? What is the relationship in size between the pin and the dovetail? In other words. Um, are these little pins that I'm marking the ideal? Should they be that size? Or should they be the same size as the dovetails? Well, carpenters and people that want to make things really strong say that if the pins are the same tight size as the dovetails, you've got optimum strength. But cabinet makers like little pins. It looks neat and it looks tidy. In fact, on things like uh, Georgian dressing mirrors that go on top of a chest of drawers, you want little teeny winny baby pins and they just put the dovetail saw in and wiggle it about a bit and that's the pin. Anyhow, that's a, that's a reasonable size and it's, they're, they're easy to cut. I want to cut from the other side um, in this, so what I'm going to do, I square these lines over. In other words, these, these, these ends of the, of the dovetail, I'll square them down the end of the, the draw lining. Uh, you'll see why in a minute. There we are, all squared down nicely. And I want to put those tails back onto the other side. So there we go. I'll let you do a little secret. I really love cutting dovetails. It was about the fourth year of my apprenticeship. The old workshop foreman said to me, is there anything you haven't done much of, Jim, that you really fancy doing? And I said, I haven't done much dovetailing. He said, well, that's lucky, because we got a fitment to make for Barclays Bank, and it's got 50 drawers in it. So I dovetailed 50 drawers. I didn't fancy dovetailing much after that for a while. Now I'm going to gauge, if you remember we set this up, this is the length of the dovetail, we set it up on the end of the drawer. We've already got it in faint across the inside of the drawer, but because we don't want a nasty gauge line across their tails when we cut it, we're only going to actually mark, we're going to mark in between. So that's the pin, and we're going to cut the pins out, remember, on this. So we mark the pins like so, and the pin there, and then at the end. There we go. We need that on the end grain as well, on the top of the drawer, so we can see where to saw. And the same there. Now I'm going to give you a tip. 
most beginners, sooner or later, saw the wrong bit out. So what I suggest you do is take a soft pencil or a bit of lumber crayon or something and actually mark the bits you're going to cut out. Just to remind you when you've got the saw in your hand and you get carried away with your exuberance that you don't saw the wrong bit away. Because believe me, it's most discombobulating when you get to put the drawer together and you find all you've got left is pins everywhere. So there we are, that's what we're going to get rid of. We, we certainly wouldn't set all the drawer sides out. We can set one out and we can clamp all the drawer sides together, square the lines over the top and saw them all in one foul swoop. This one, we're lucky we've only got one to saw. So let's see what we can do. The easiest way is to hold it vertically in the vise There we are, and now we need to saw down the sides of the tails. There's two tools for this. There's the standard saw, guess what it's called, a dovetail saw. That's the normal western tool. Or we can use a Japanese Dazuki no Kagori, which is probably used by a lot of top cabinet makers now. They're a gorgeous saw. But we'll use the, the western saw today. And here we go. So we actual fact. to saw all the tails on one side first with the saw sloping one way and then come back the other way and you'll see in a minute that it doesn't matter if we've been a little bit inaccurate the main thing is to make sure that the saw is square across the job but if you don't keep exactly on the line for the tail that doesn't matter very much at this stage Well, there we are. Now some people will tell you to hold this in advice so that the line on the side of the dovetail is vertical because then you can saw nice and straight down and then you have to go the other way, turn it up and saw this. That certainly isn't the way of the craftsman. If you can't saw to a line, doesn't matter what angle, you ought to be practicing sawing, not cutting dovetails. Now we have to cut these pieces out of the pins. Now there's several ways of doing that. Some people put them on the bench on a piece of waste and chop them out with a chisel. I'm not too keen on that. I'll leave them in the vise. And I'll take a... I'll take a coping saw. and I saw out the bulk of the... the bulk of the pin. There we are. Now we've got to true that up. We need a piece of wood, a piece of scrap wood on the bench because we don't want to damage our bench. Now in years gone by, cabinet makers used to stone the side, the actual slope of an of a ordinary beveled edge chisel. In other words, 
they'd take a beveled edge chisel and they'd stone this slope until it actually formed a sharp edge with the back of the chisel because they've got to get in the corner. Well, we don't do that anymore because our friends, the Japanese, actually had a, a dovetail chisel as one of our standard tools. And it's a gorgeous little brute. So we don't need to mess about anymore. Now what we've got to do, we've got to come back to that point where we gauged our line. And we want to go straight through the work. I don't think we... Yes, there it is. Now you'll notice that I'm tending to pare down in there, out of upright. In other words, I'm sloping away from the line. There's a very good reason for this, which you'll see in a minute. Turn the job over. See these nasty little cuts? They'd be in your bench top if you didn't use a paring board. And a lot of people don't bother. I've always said that the cabinet maker's bench is probably his most important tool and you certainly wouldn't dream of cutting into the top. Again, I'm still paring slightly away on a slope, so there tends to be a, a bump in the middle here. But last of all, I begin to pair down straight and I'll get rid of the bump and I can see that the chisel now is making a cut from one side of the wood right through to the other. Now it's important that this is a nice straight clean cut from one side to the other. It doesn't want to have a bump in it in the middle and it certainly doesn't want to have a hollow in the middle because it relies a great deal on that being a nice flat fit for strength. Well there we go. That's the intermediate pins cut out. That leaves us these two pieces to cut off and we cut them off with the saw by putting it in the vise taking the saw, we just saw those end pieces out. It's very, very important that having sawn them out, that this little piece here, this corner, quite often it gets left with a little piece of wood actually in the corner. That will hold the joint off. So we want to make sure that we've got a beautiful, clean, sharp corner there. And it's very, very difficult to get in there. It's, it's it's a point that is most important. This, of course, also applies right across the job. In other words, what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to make sure that this is clean right through here, right through the joint. In those corners, I don't want the slightest little piece of wood left in there. So there it is, that's our draw side with the pins cut on it. Now we come to the draw front and we need to mark those pins onto our draw front. What we have is a problem, in other words, we have trouble seeing lines that are marked on end grains of dark woods. But what we can do, we can take a piece of ordinary chalk 
And if we rub it over, over the end grain, and then get rid of any We've now got quite a reasonable marking surface. Now we need to mark those onto this. And if you remember, I'll mark the line again so that it's very, very clear for you. If you remember, that is the depth of the actual pins. Now what we do to mark that, we put this piece in the vise. And we take a tool or a block of wood and we come down to the height of it, like that. This moves back there. Then this goes on there. Notice the two, the two and the half circle. It's got to be the right piece of wood. We're certainly not going to mark the wrong ones. We line the front of the dovetails, the length of the dovetails, up with the line that we scribed from the back. That's no great problem. Now we need to hold this. Some clever people hold it while they mark it. I don't like that, it's got a habit of moving. So what I do, I put a cramp on it. I actually hold it like that. And there it is, nicely in position. If it's not, you can adjust it very, very gently by just... Okay, you want this piece here that the face edges want to be in perfect alignment. If you're not sure, you can, you can put something across to, to check. But that is the exact position that the side is in to the front, ready for marking. Now, some books and instructors are tell you to mark that with a tenon saw on the side of the tails, but you're left with the width of a saw cut mark on there, and it's not at all accurate, and what's more, you've destroyed part of the draw end that you want to fit against the tails. I have a special tool that I make for myself. This is just ground out of an old piece of hacksaw blade. It's sharpened to a point, on, and then sharpened both sides. It's absolutely flat on the back, and the reason for that is we've now got a right-handed marking knife and a left-handed marking knife in one tool. And we use that to mark these dovetails onto the end grain of the front. And you'll see that being thin and flat, it fits right against the dovetail. Then we turn it over and because it's pointed, it's left and right hand, so now we need it the other hand to mark the other side of the tails. And there we are, that's marked out. And you can see our dovetails. Now, do you remember before I said don't cut the wrong bit away when we were doing the tails? Well, we're going to cut the pins now, so let's just shade that to remind us that that is the bit of wood we're going to cut out, because it's not unknown for somebody to cut that bit out when they wanted that bit. So there we are, all nicely marked. Now we've got them on. Now what we've got to do is to square those back along the inside, so that when we cut them, we're nice and straight. It's worth taking a bit of care doing this next bit because this is part of what affects the actual final fit of the joint. There we are. Now, of course, we've got to remove this piece of wood, leaving this and its surrounds, which means we can't saw the whole of that out. But we can saw part, which will give us a, a good guide to, um, 
to work to with a chisel. So in actual fact, what we're going to do is we have to saw at an angle, keep just inside the line. Remember, the saw cut must be in the waist. There we go. This is a lot easier if you've got a vice that is a tail vice on the bench and you can actually have the wood at an angle. If it's in the in the front vice of a bench, it has to be vertical and you find yourself working on your knees to get the handle of the saw down low enough. There we go. Well, there we are. We've sawn in. Now we've got to remove this wood in the middle. This is quite a delicate operation. If you pare down, take it in small bites, but don't quite get to the, the line where you mark the lap. Leave yourself a bit to clean out later on. Of course, one of the major secrets of this is that the chisel has got to be really sharp. It's that first cut, that first cut at the front, at the front of the tail as you're taking it out. You've got nothing to stop the chisel, so you have to be very, very careful. You don't go down and cut into the lap. You'll find that the, the chisel will drop into the line. Do you remember the, the line we made across here? This one we made with the cutting gauge. You'll find that the chisel drops into that lovely at the end of the at the end of the tail as we cut it out. It's funny, most people consider, when they st first start thinking about cutting dovetails, particularly by hand, they think it's such a long-winded job but it's not, it's surprising. Um, of course, you need to be a bit systematic in your work. In other words, you certainly wouldn't mark one drawer end and then cut that. If you had a dozen drawers, you'd mark a dozen drawer ends. Or a dozen drawers, you'd mark 24 drawer ends, sorry. And then you'd work them all and get them all to the same stage moving forward all the time. Um, of course, you've always got that old, old problem, and I've still got it, and I must have cut thousands of dovetails in my lifetime. I'm still rather eager to put the two parts together to see how they fit. Now, as you can see, we're beginning to come to those little cuts now that really matter. This is, this is what we're doing now, determines whether the joint's going to fit or not.
Right now we need to clean that last little bit out. This is where it gets really, really delicate. When we get to about this stage, it becomes easier now to finish it back in the vise. So we need to return that to its original position. There we are, and away we go. We'll have a slightly different chisel for that. And we can now cut down the grain now you'll see that uh, Jim had a little whoopsie there, look, when we were pairing the other way. In the old days, I'd have got fine sixpence for that. Um, if you overrun a saw and a, a mortise in, sorry, a dovetail in, um, everything was done on the book. There was a, a set, set sum of money for, for each operation. And if they could see any inaccuracies like that. Each one was sixpence. So if you weren't careful, you ended up at the end of the week owing the governor money. There we are, you can see what's happening. Be very careful. Now, those nice fine lines that you put on with the, with the marking knife, when we mark the, mark the dovetails onto the end grain here, they give us a really good indication and you'll find that the chisel will drop into those marks so in actual fact you're cutting exactly on the mark in actual fact you'll find a lot of people refer to these parts that we're cutting out now as the sockets um, in other words the bits where the tail dovetail goes in it's called the socket. Now, one of the points I, I really must draw your attention to is just how sharp these tools are. Now, of course, I don't have to tell you that really the secret of all woodwork is absolutely sharp tools. If they're not sharp, you just can't cut accurately with them because what happens is the tool takes the path of least resistance and goes where you don't want it to go. And in this case, it's got to go exactly, exactly where we require it to cut. This is, this is very, very important that we do this part right. There's no need to try and rush it. I'll get quite a lot of pleasure out of doing this, so why rush? It's a nice, quiet job. The only thing is that stooping over all the time like this makes my old back ache. There we go. back and give them a final a final touch up in a minute Of course, um, I suppose you could say I've cheated a bit really because I've got a very nice piece of mild grain mahogany here and it's cutting beautiful. If this was a nice 
curly piece of walnut, um, it'd be a different story altogether. In fact, if I had any air left, I'd probably be tearing that out by now. The last one, look. Oh, the grain's a bit different down this end. I shouldn't have crowed quite so soon. It's important to try and keep the tools vertical so you get a nice straight cut. Don't undercut if you can help it. Um, this is an old dodge is undercutting. In fact, there's a saying in the trade, if you keep your back shoulders off, your front shoulders always come up. Of course, they're really referring to mortars and tenons, but it applies to nearly all joints. Um, if you stop the parts that you can't see, if you keep them with a lot of clearance, the actual edges that are at the site fit perfectly. But um, of course, the joint's nowhere near as strong as it should be. Now we need a different chisel. I'll go back to the to the Japanese dovetail chisel that is triangular in section. And I can get right into these, these back corners with that. And it's important that they're nice and sharp and clean right to the bottom. not back to the line on this one quite. We're still just off the line. Let's have a, a morsel off the side. There we are, that's better. I think that'll do us. So now just this final, final clear up. There's a, a little a little tip in actual fact um, for all all aging woodworkers we all end up having to wear glasses and you'll find that when you go to the opticians he checks your eyes and then he insists on giving you a pair of glasses for reading well you know um, Unfortunately, they're not what's wanted for woodwork. They tend to be just the wrong length. In other words, we don't, we get closer to the work quite often than we do with the reading length. And then quite often, the other stream is we're working farther away. So you really need glasses that have two focal lengths. So instead of having reading glasses, I have bifocals made for the bench. And the top part a 30 inch focus and the bottom a 10 inch focus. And I've established that over about five pair of glasses now. And that works fine for me. And that is very important that we see properly when we're doing this sort of work. Well, there we are. That's the sockets all cut out. Um, I don't like that little bit. I'm ashamed of that, but never mind. We'll get round that. Now we come back. Here we've got the tails. Now we, we come to a bit that, that worries a lot of amateur woodworkers. Professionally, we only ever put a dovetail together once. You don't put it together and see if it fits and take it apart and mess about. We glue it and we put it together and that's it. It's not fitted. But before we do that, there's one little tip I'll give you. You see these little 
sharp corners down here on the dovetail. Well, when you put the, the thing together, they have a habit of breaking off and rolling up in the joint and stopping it coming together. So with a very, very sharp chisel, just take that corner off. Just, it's a minute little chamfer. Not a great big one, just a minute little chamfer because if you don't take that off, it'll roll off as you put the joint together. Takes a lot of control of the tool just to take the amount you want. It's not a bad idea at the very end just to have a quick look at the tails to make sure that, particularly if you're cutting a lot, that there's no little nasties left that are going to stop the, the work coming together. Well, I think we've now come to the really important bit. So if this was a drawer, what we do, we glue this and we glue in here. So you need to take a brush and paint the surface of all the mating surfaces, wherever this part touches that part, whether it's in the sockets, the sides of the sockets, they all want coating with glue. Don't rely on putting a little blob of glue from a squeezy in each socket and hoping to God that it'll spread out when you put the things together, because it won't. Anyway, there we are. It's glued and we put it together once and for all. Always drive um, dovetails together with a strip of wood. Don't rely on uh, on, on just tapping the piece with a, with a softening block. Get a nice, a nice solid piece of wood. There you go. A lap dovetail. Now, the principles that we used in cutting that are exactly the same, literally, for every dovetail joint. No matter what sort, we cut one half of the joint and we mark the other half from it with a sharp tool. The mitred dovetail, the mitred secret dovetail that we saw at the beginning of the video, is the only one where we cut the actual pins before we cut the tails. You'll find that it's impossible to mark the pins from the tails, but it's possible to mark the tails from the pins. But apart from that, we always cut the tails first and mark the pins, and away we go. So that is it, really we've cut a lap dovetail which of course would be the front of a, a drawer and we just have a, a very fine shaving off of there and the drawer should fit. So that's dovetails. Well so is this. Look at that and you think oh yeah it's another halving dovetail but it's not. It's dovetailed the other way. And on the other surface of the wood, we've got ordinary halving joint. Now just think about this. I want you to cogitate on this one. I'm going to puzzle you. How the hell do those two pieces of wood go together? And when you can cut one of those, you can cut dovetails.